time. On small ships, such as the Cyrus Field, the cable is paid out by the bow. Through the anchor port holes, we see the cable slipping down into the water. Four miles out to sea, a buoy is attached to the end of the cable. The buoy is dropped, and in the hurry and scurry, the ship's doctor nearly becomes his own patient. Next day, the Dominia of London, the largest cable-laying ship afloat, steams up the coast and prepares to pick up buoy and cable. and haul the board the big ship to be tested. Captain Victor Campus. This is how the cable might look in relation to ship and shore at this time. Up goes the cable layers internationally recognized in senior, warning other ships to stand clear. And the cable is looped in for testing. All tests over the cable having proved satisfactory, the jointers start work on the first splice. Making ready to lower the joined and tested cable into the sea. The cable is maneuvered into proper paying out position astern as the ship swings her bow east, southeast. To an observant fish, this is the way it might look. And so we are off to the accompaniment of whirring wheels and roaring cable brakes. The paying out machinery controls the speed with which the cable reaches the ocean bottom. the cable back to its source in the great storage tanks below, where no motion picture camera has ever been before. Every moment, day and night, men are on duty here, helping unwind the slippery, hissing, snake-like cargo, where a kink might mean disaster. This is the course we are following. Inside the ship's testing room, electrical impulses are alternately sent and received over the cable as it is laid in the ocean. Soon the barometer begins to drop and orders are issued to make things snug aloft. And on deck. Next morning, the sun rises in a robe of angry-looking copper. The watch below. All hands respond to the bosun's pipe. The opening rush of a mile a minute cyclone. The helmsman finds his hands full. Keep the ship's prow on the course. Roaring green hills of water explode into foam about us. And 
See that skyline real at drunken angle. Still our helmsman holds his own. While our rudder is swept high out and very deep in the turmoil. Navigators find they have held the ship true to her course, despite the opposition of the elements. So here, off the island, we prepare to cut the deep sea section of the cable. A buoy is made ready for launching. The cable is wound with chains, which are attached to the buoy. Cable Chief Werner directs operations from up forward. Buoy chain cable is guided from the stern by hand. Up far it, the buoy hawser is cut. And the big iron bubble floats clear. Then the cable itself is cut. This buoy marks the deep sea end of the new telegraph line reaching back to Newfoundland. Dominia heads for the port of Porta under appropriate escort. And the lovely rainbow lights our way. The coastline of our island port 
sweeps gracefully off in the clouds of mist. One of the world's great cable centers with its 15 ocean telegraph lines. Pico, the great volcano, twice the size of Vesuvius. In this land of earthquakes, Western Union buildings typify endurance and efficiency. Early next morning, the big ship transfers the Azores shore section of the cable to a barge. And in the quiet waters of Tim Bay, at the back door of water, the heavily armored cable is floated ashore. Over a beach of volcanic cinders, a great talking hawser is borne by the barefooted and clamorous islanders. Into the landing hut. Then the barge is towed seaward, paying out the cable as she goes. Next day, the Dominia lays the connecting link. And after thorough tests have been made on the cable, work on the last joint begins. And night is upon us before the final splice is completed. The joined cable is heaved overboard. holding the cable to the ship are cut. And so the completed cable sinks to the ocean bed nearly a mile below. Roland and Freeman, our engineer observers, check the cable's course from start to finish and find that one of the most difficult of all deep-sea engineering problems has worked out correctly to the fraction of a mile, despite the cyclone. Returning to Horta and the operating station where the new cable terminates, we find this Western Union man sending a message back to New York, eight times faster than any ordinary cable could carry it. Known as multiplex distributing heads, these whirling regulators of cable traffic have helped materially in reducing the cost of cablegrams between Europe and America. Sending and receiving messages over the great cable line which this one is by far the fastest. So the Dominion's men say,